Amanda Gorman, we listened to a poem that she wrote about hope. And I'm going to begin with just a few phrases of her, her sermon, her poem. It goes like this. Ensure this ache wasn't endured in vain. Do not ignore the pain. Give it purpose. From a wave of woes, our world will emerge stronger. And so how do we emerge stronger from this unusual season of COVID? How will this experience shape you? Our lives have been disrupted in major ways and our world will never be the same. I think that this experience will forever change our sanitation practices as a society in the same way that 9-11 uh, changed our security practices as a society. And so how has this wave of woes impacted you? We could come out depressed and isolated, filled with fear, or we can give the pain purpose and emerge stronger. How have you already experienced good coming from bad? I see more compassion I feel clear about the values I live by, and I've experienced renewed and stronger connection with more people in my life, even though we are physically distanced. How have you experienced good? See, our God is a God of redemption. Our God works to bring good out of bad. Romans 8.28 declares that in all things, we know that God works for good. For those who love God. And so we are looking to the Apostle Paul to help us answer this question of how we can emerge stronger. He endured much hardship in his life and yet he remained strong. He has, was made stronger by each trial he endured. And so when he got to the life, at the end of his life, um, he wrote these words in 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. He wrote, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. I hope that we can say those same words when we emerge on the other side of this pandemic. In our Upper Room devotional guide this week, Sarah Lunsford reflected on this passage. As she read Paul's words about finishing the race, she thought that it was significant that he just mentions that he finished the race. She thought about her son, who loves to run. He runs and runs, and he's on their high school cross-country team. He even qualified for state championships. She was so proud of him, and so on that final meet, that state championship meet, she went to watch him run, and a cross-country race, they go out and run all over, and then they come back, and so she was waiting at the finish line for him, and here come the first runners, and he's not there. And then a few more runners, and he wasn't in that group, but a few more. And they kind of kept coming across the line in clusters, and she didn't see her son. And then finally off in the distance, she saw her son in second to last place. And as she did, people weren't cheering much anymore. <laughs> they weren't paying much attention, in fact. But she thought about these words of Paul and thought, how our society is so focused on who comes in first and maybe first, second, and third. And yet we don't pay much attention to those who come in last. And yet she was still so proud of her son for persevering and enduring that race and finishing. And so she realized it was significant that Paul had said, he didn't say I finished the race first. That's not the point in our Christian life. It's just to finish and to cross that line. And when we do, God is very proud of us. God is standing by our side. In fact, God is giving us the strength we need to be able to persevere and finish the race. And so these are helpful words for us in these days. The point is not to be the best or the strongest or the fastest, but the point is to keep the faith, to endure, to persevere to continue to be faithful when God calls us. God has work for us to do in these days. And so for some people, some of us, we have easily adapted to some new ways of moving through society. 
others of us are struggling more, and that is to just be human. It doesn't matter whether it's difficult or easy or you're finding joy or struggle. We are all called to finish the race faithfully. Paul gives us a glimpse of how we do that in his life. I was thinking the story that came to my mind, this one is, is from the chapter, is from Acts chapter 16, and it's a whole chapter. So I hope you don't mind if I don't read the whole chapter. I'm just going to summarize the story. Uh, so the story was that Paul and Silas were healing and teaching and preaching. Um, and I'm trying to remember what city they're in, but it doesn't really matter. So anyways, what they healed a girl of her spirits. And then the next day they got arrested for doing that. And so they ended up in jail. So Peter and Silas in jail, and uh, the jailer was told, be very careful, don't let them escape. And so the jailer took Paul and Silas and put them in the very inner room of the prison, and he locked down their arms and legs in the shackles in that room, and he made sure that they stayed there. Um, so here's Paul and Silas, they've been beaten, They've been arrested unjustly, really. The crime was healing somebody. And here they find themselves in the very inner room of the prison. And at midnight, they started singing hymns and praying. Now, I don't know about you, that would not be my natural reaction. <laughs> if I was in prison, I think I would be grumbling. I surely would have been praying, but it probably would not have been a nice, uplifting kind of prayer. Um, but they were in prison singing hymns and praying in such a way that it got the attention of all the, the other inmates. It's, the scriptures tell us they were listening to him. And then an earthquake hit and rattled that prison in a way that opened the doors and loosened their chains. And instead of running out, Paul and Silas stayed there and somehow convinced the other prisoners to do the same. And then that prisoner guard, who was tasked with keeping them in the prison, was preparing to kill himself. He pulled out a sword because he knew that either he would be imprisoned or executed himself if the prisoners escaped. And so as he pulled out his sword, Paul said, no, stop, do not harm yourself, we are all here. And then he shared his faith with that prison, the guard, and then the guard and his family all came to faith in Jesus. Now, the other thing that's odd to me about this story about Paul and Silas is, had the earthquake happened, I think I would have responded like, oh, thank you, God. There's a miracle. You are, you are setting me free from this prison term in which I was unjustly accused. Uh, but Paul and Silas don't see that as a miracle for their freedom. They see it as an opportunity to share the love and the grace of God. In fact, that's what they did in prison. And so it's interesting to me, and I think uh, important for us, to recognize that even when they found themselves in prison, Paul and Silas were still clear on their purpose. They still knew that their life purpose was to share the love and grace of God. And so they found a way to do that, even from prison. And I think we are called to do the same. We are all called to share the love of grace and grace of God in our own unique and special way. And we need to do that whether we're free out in the community or hold up in our homes or whatever that looks like. And so for them, they persevered through their trial. They kept their focus. They kept running the race and they held on to faith. They adapted to their circumstances, and they pursued their purpose. And that is one thing that we can do to be able to emerge stronger from this. We can continue to pursue our purpose. Now, later in Act, Luke's rec Luke records these words of Paul. This is Acts 20, 22 to 24, and it goes like this. And now, um, compelled by the Spirit, I, who is Paul, am going to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given to me, 
the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. And so in these words, Paul summarizes what he views as his life purpose, to testify to the good news of God's grace. So how can we do that? And how do we need to pivot and adapt in these days in order to pursue our purpose? Now, I'm not saying that we all have to become preachers and evangelists. I don't think preaching is everybody's calling. We are not all called to, um, to minister in that way. But we are all called to find ways to testify to the grace of the good news of God in our own authentic ways. And so I'm going to call out a few people here, and I know there's more, but I know that Luann and Carol have been spending a lot of time sewing masks, and I know others of you have as well. And so I think that they have pursued their purpose in these days. I bet they never sewed masks before this all happened. And I remember hearing the stories early on about finding patterns and experimenting and having to adapt because all the supplies were not available that they needed. But they came up with a way uh, to create those masks and they sent many, I don't know what the numbers are, but they made many and have sent them to the hospital. I know they provided me with some. Um, they have sent masks to their family around the country and all over. And so they were able to pivot and adapt and use their giftedness to share the grace with other people. And so how could you do that? How can you pursue your purpose in these days? And how might you need to pivot and adapt in order to do that, to share the love of God? So Frederick Buechner writes in his book, Wishful Thinking About Vocation. He defines vocation as the work one is called by God to do. He believes that this is unique for each one of us. Each one of us has unique talents and passions and experiences. We each have our own arena of influence. And so God's call is unique for each one of us. And I'm sure many of you have settled into your call across your lifetime, your vocation, you've you've worked toward a purpose and you're pretty clear about who you are and what you can offer. Others of us are wrestling with that our whole lifetime, I think. However, everything has been disrupted and we can't do things the way that we usually do. And so we have to adapt. So teachers have had to adapt the way that they interact with their students. Even doctors and nurses have had to pivot how they interact with their parent, their patients. And Essential workers, I hope, are finding new meaning and significance in the work that they do, stocking shelves, clerking in stores, uh, serving food to people through the back alley or the front door in to-go containers. And remember the reflection on the race. Our goal is not to be first or best, to be strongest or riches or have the glorious job. The point is to keep the faith as we finish the race. Now Buechner goes on to describe how we can discern our calling at any given point of our life. How, can we, how we can find our vocation and discover, discover our purpose. And so these are the questions I'm going to ask you now and in a few minutes we'll break into groups and you can share with one another. He writes that the place God calls you is the place where your deepest gladness meets the world's hunger. And so your deepest gladness, what are your skills and your joys? What brings you joy in life? What brings you significance and meaning? And then what are the needs of the world? Where are the places that there are needs that you can uh, meet up with, that you can connect? How can you offer your gifts to the world? I bet Luann and Carol and all those mask makers out there hadn't ever sewn masks before, but they found a way to do it. They adapted and pursued their purpose. So how can you pursue your purpose in these days? How can you pivot and adapt in order to do so? Paul and Silas sang hymns in prison. 
Can you think of a way that you can share the good news of God's grace with others this week? Let us pray together. Our gracious God, you are a God of great diversity, of great creativity, of great ingenuity. You have created each one of us to be special. You have given each one of us gifts and experience and passions that uniquely positions us to reach out to others. You have given us each a story that we can share with others about how life, how we've experienced life and how we've experienced your presence pursuing us and helping us through life. And so, Lord, in these moments, I pray that you help us to first be encouraged and affirmed that we might recognize our giftedness and how you've created us. And then I would pray that we feel challenged to find ways that we can continue to go and share that with the world. So Lord, be with us, affirm us, encourage us, inspire us, challenge us, that we might be your hands and feet in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to go into groups really quick. We're going to put you in groups of four or five, and you'll have five minutes to share, six minutes to share, something like that. So take a moment to introduce yourselves and then make sure each person gets a chance to share. Um, and then uh, here, so those are your basic questions. What are your gifts and passions? How do you get joy? And then where do you see that connecting with the needs of the world? How can you share the good news of Christ in your life? So we're gonna break you into groups for, what did I say? Six minutes. Uh, so take some time to share and then come back. We'll come back to this group. So here we go. Can you unmute everybody? They can unmute themselves. No. Yeah, I will. Amanda, this is my group. You have to let me see it. Well, but these are the people I like on Yeah, that's right. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so you're in my group. So we have a few more than I was planning, but that's okay. So who has some ideas that they want to share? And we could start by introducing ourselves, I suppose. So I'm going to call you out because it's a little easier that way. So Amanda's going to unmute everybody. Hi, I'm Larry Ruggles. Hi, Larry. And who do you have sitting next to you? Pardon? <laughs> Who's sitting next to you? Ranger sitting next to you. <laughs> Fraley, it's good to see both of you. <laughs> and Laura. over here we have Bob and Rini Daniel. So it's good to no, see. Rini ran downstairs to get coffee. <laughs> oh, did she? All right. That's all good. And Carol, it's good to see you too as well. And Peggy, we've got here, and my mom and dad, Paul and Sandy. And then we can't see, but we know we're on the screen. Uh, Bob and Lorraine are there. Um, I think iPad might be Pam, if that's Pam. Hi, Pam. Uh, Susan, Susan is uh, also on, and Shauna, Greg, and Evelyn. So anyways, of the five people we can see, uh, what aunt, what came to your mind through the sermon? What questions were raised or what ideas? What do you have that you can share with us today? Okay. <laughs> Who? Oh, that was up here. Yeah. Bob, what would you say is one of your unique gifts that you have? What makes you unique? Uh, you talking to me? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't really know, Patty. I, I, I enjoy doing things more so than, than I, I have a, I don't have an artistic bone in my body. It's more autistic. Okay. Uh, but I enjoy doing things, much like, like some of the repairs around the church and stuff like that. And, right. And just any way I can help and give input to my fellow man. 
yeah, you've got a heart to help people and yeah, the desire to help people. So that's great. So be thinking about how you can be doing that in these days. Yeah. How about you, Carol? If I unmute you, what do you got? What makes you different and unique? You have to unmute yourself. We're, you're unmuted from my side. Um, there you go. Am I there? Yeah. Is be kind. Be kind. Yeah. And you, Bob, ha Bob doesn't have artistic skills, but you do. And you've helped in several ways with your artistic skills and your creativity. That's great. Okay, mom and dad, I'm putting you on the spot. What? Go ahead, Carol. I just said thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> All right, mom and dad, I'm putting you on the spot. What do you got for us? You got to unmute yourselves. You know how to do that? Mom, you got to unmute. We were kind of choosing not to participate. I know, but <laughs> here you are and I'm calling you out. So sorry. <laughs> well, you, you sewed masks, mom. So that's I one thing masks. you did. I sewed masks. I still am searching for the perfect mask. I have yet to find it. I found several that are comfortable. <laughs> so, um, Dad's busy this week with income taxes. What can I say? That's not a particular gift. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we just have to do things. That's part of it too. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, we're, you know, our work these days is to downsize, get ready to move. If only somebody would come and look at the house, we'd feel a lot better. <laughs> yeah. But so you've also had an eye to help people in that. You made some of your handoffs, cast offs available yes. to others who can make use of them. So that's good. Right. Yeah. A big tornado hit our nearby town. Our church. Yeah, in our church. So we've reached out a bit to uh, provide some funds and. Um, or people who are struggling there. We drove through the neighborhood the other day and it's real devastation. Um, it's a mess. Yeah, a big mess. Mm -hmm. so, Tornado hit their town. Mm -hmm. So um, we're still trying to make contact with some people that were good friends that we've not found out what happened after they had to vacate their houses. Mm. So those kinds of things still go on. Yeah. They do. Well, thanks for, and if you haven't seen, Steve Wood is on today, so. I did, I did scroll okay. over and see him. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I didn't pay attention. All right, we got one minute to go. So everybody's gonna start coming back here, which is great, and then we'll um, sing a song and celebrate communion. All right, welcome back, people. All right, people are coming back. So we're going to get ready to sing another song, and then we'll celebrate communion together, and then um, we'll be done. So people are still coming back, but I think that we can start singing our song. So... Our next song is Preparing Us for Communion. We're going to sing together, Let Us Break Bread Together, uh, and then we will move into a time of communion. So let's sing that together. Thank you. 
Oh. Okay, I'll start over again. I'm sorry, I keep forgetting my own microphone. <laughs> we'll just. Okay, all right, let's try again. So, communion, I invite you to take whatever food you have, what you have to eat. Uh, Jesus ran up the table because that was common on her table. And so, you might not have bread at home, but you might have something else. Let's take that bread, Jesus bread, and you broke it, you blessed it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. So go ahead and take a bite, inviting the Holy Spirit to satisfy the hunger in your soul. As we receive this bread, we receive the grace of God. And then Jesus took the cup. Again, his cup had juice from a grape, whether it was fermented or not, we don't know, wine or juice, either way. That was what was common on every table. And so go ahead whatever you might have, uh, and you will invite the Holy Spirit to fill us with power and grace as we receive the fruit of the vine. And so, Holy Spirit, come. Fill us, nourish us, heal us, empower us, and send us out that we might be your hands and your feet in the world. All right, our benediction from today, I'm first going to share more words from Amanda Gorman and then a quick blessing. So, from a wave of woes, our world will emerge stronger. We'll observe how the burdens braved by humankind are also the moments that make us humans kind. Let every dawn find us courageous brought closer, heeding the light before the fight is over. When this ends, we'll smile sweetly, finally seeing in testing times, we became the best of beings. And so may God bless you as you pursue, pursue your purpose and shine your light in this week. Go in peace. Amen. All right, so our service is...